thank you, Mindy, for that gift. Good morning. Here we are. <laughs> so good to see everyone today. I welcome you uh, to worship in this family of God at First Baptist Ames, whether by in person or on Zoom. We welcome everyone and are glad that you are here. Just a few announcements before we start our worship. And uh, well, you'll note, by the way, of those that there is no church school classes today. We will resume those next week. Um, this is, I suppose, our last official Sunday for the Christmas offering. The, the um, envelope should still be in the pews. Um, they may even accept it if you give it next week. But we are ending our emphasis today, so remember that and, and thank you for participating. The newsletter, the spire, will go out this week, so if you have anything that you want included, please do so by Wednesday with the church office. And I was, it was called to my attention that the men's breakfast will be held this week on Tuesday morning. I see the thumbs up back there. Um, Perkins at 8 o'clock, as usual, so it was omitted from your bulletin, but it will be happening on Tuesday morning. Let's see, anything else? Um, Beth Douglas serves as our Deacon of the Week this week, and she's available to us. You'll find her number listed on the back of your bulletin if you have a need that you need um, to let someone know about or, or be in touch about. And, of course, we can all give thanks, uh, extra thanks to Joe today as he works his tech magic to bring our guest proclaimer to us. Uh, the Reverend Jim Hines, a retired um, American Baptist minister, is with us by Zoom, as he and Anne have been since the beginning of the pandemic. And he will be bringing our message via Zoom today. So it'll be a new experience, and we'll all get to participate in that. Jim, thank you for being here and for being with us and being willing to proclaim God's message to us today. Okay, let's turn our attention now to worship and join me in our call to worship. Um, as always, I will read the light print and you will respond with the dark. This is adapted from Psalm 8 and Psalm 148. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. When we look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, God, the moon, the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? mortals that you care for them yet you have made all people a little lower than you O god and crowned them with glory and honor O lord our sovereign how majestic is your name in all the earth let them praise the name of the lord for his name alone is exalted his glory is above the earth and heaven he has raised up a horn for his people, praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise, praise the, Lord. the Lord. Join me now, if you will, in prayer. Almighty God, we rejoice that Messiah has come. In these weeks, we have opened our eyes to see Jesus and to lift our hearts in worship. God of glory, your splendor shone from a manger in Bethlehem into the darkness of human night. 
even now, come into our hearts again. Turn our darkness into light. End our sad divisions and be our king of peace. Let us never fail to find room for you or for your children. As we embark on a new year, draw us deeper into the mystery of your love. Open our eyes that we may see you in others and in ourselves, we pray. Amen. Our first hymn today is Infant Holy, Infant Lowly, and it's number 143 in your blue hymnal. Uh, let's stand together if you're able as we sing. moments to greet each other and tell each other how we see Christ in you.
our scripture reading today is found in Luke 2, verses 22 through 35. You'll find it in your pew Bible on page 59. I'll be reading from the New International Version today. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and the sword will pierce your own soul too. Next hymn is quite familiar to all of us. Uh, you'll find it in 138 in your blue hymnal. Let's stand together, if you will, as we sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain.
Well, good morning, church. I hope that you can see me okay in the screens in the sanctuary. For those on Zoom, if you will give me a thumbs up, I'll know that you are hearing and seeing me as well. Thank you, Johnny. First, I want to bring a, before I offer the second reading, I want to offer thanks to Pastor Day for the invite to come before you this morning with my humble message and to Kay for leading worship from Ames, to Joe for all the technical work in the background so that all of this comes to pass, and finally to Mindy for the music we've sung today. When in December of 2020, Pastor Dave asked me to bring a message after Christmas, all of you were at home watching on Zoom, or you had the opportunity. There were only a few people in the sanctuary, and the television screens weren't there, so it's completely different now. I ask that you be ready to follow along if you want. I'm going to read from Revelation 21. You might find that in the Pew Bible on page 259. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the thrones also said, See, I am making all things new. And write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Here ends this second reading. May God add wisdom and guidance through the hearing of his holy words. Amen. Alpha and Omega are the Greek words for the beginning and the end. Life as we well know has both of these. In a similar manner, so do most personal relationships or employment periods. Stories have a starting point and some form of conclusion. The same with jokes, which are just another form of storytelling. Scripture has both as well, a start and an end. There are Genesis and Malachi in the Hebrew scriptures, Matthew and Revelation in the Christian writings, and considered as a whole unit, Christians view the arc of stories and time explored within the Bible as running from Genesis to Revelation. Today marks the end of the calendar year. It is 2023 today, 2024 tomorrow, or the end and the beginning, Alpha and Omega, reversed. These two words come with complexities and baggage as well. The word beginning might imply to many a clean slate, a newness like unsullied snow in the winter, or smooth sand at the seashore after the tide goes out. Many people are glad about beginnings which includes change to come, yet some are fearful, feeling it better to stay with the known 
no matter how problematic. Do you want to stay in 2023? Or are you ready for 2024? The word ending might imply conclusion, finality, or wrapping things up. Again, some people are more than ready to wrap things up. They've had enough of the past or even the present. While some are not ready for things, for life, for journeys to end, they want the story, the arc of time to continue. They don't want to let go of the now, no matter how fretful now may be with the uncertainty of the unwritten future. So that's where we find ourselves today on December 31st, 2023. The year wraps up in just over 13 hours from now in central time. The month of December ends as well. Now, in order to celebrate Christmas and the exchange of gifts, many people wrap the present. Most of these gifts have been unwrapped, the leavings tossed away. And the year 2023 is thus nearly unwrapped. What leavings are you ready to toss away? How has your year been? Did it roll out smoothly or with lots of bumps along the way? Were there times of uncertainty? Were there too many challenges or changes? These questions could pretty much describe most lives in most years. Many people have periods of goodness and joy, as well as times of fear and sorrow. There is both weariness and wariness with the events in their lives, their families, their communities, the nation, this world. And this also pretty much describes the expected state of things. Each life or each year might certainly have periods of greater fear, sorrow, want, or darkness, though everybody's mileage varies in this respect. And the same can be said about times of joy, fun, plenty, and light. Again, I must note, we stand on the cusp of a new year. And then, and within the church traditions, we stand at the conclusion of the Christmas season and the start of, Pif of Epiphany, which has the story of Magi witnessing to God's work in the world. Now, the scripture from Matthew told the story of Jesus and Mary, bringing Jesus to the temple for the rite of purification and dedication. The new parents have now probably left Bethlehem where they journeyed for a census registration. They are returning to Nazareth, a journey of about 90 miles. The temple in Jerusalem would easily be on the way, about 25 miles north, but they're not using Interstate 35, they're walking. While smaller communities might have some community meeting and worship space, there was only one temple with a capital T in Jerusalem. Now in support of the interpretation of scripture that God would send a chosen one, a savior, a Messiah for a people living in darkness and fear, Matthew writes of the caring parents doing their proper Jewish duties. And he introduces the reader to Simeon, an elder who has received a vision promising to see the Messiah before he dies. I ponder, did Simeon have a visit from an angel? Many others in the birth narratives had such a visit. Pastor Dave has reminded us about the angels who came to many, such as Elizabeth, Mary, Joseph, the shepherds. They came to them with ponderous words, be not afraid, do not fear. Scripture does not include Simeon in that experience, but I could easily envision a similar encounter. 
He has been waiting in the temple for years. And he sees in the young couple there with a newborn what others don't see. At the end of Simeon's life, he sees a new beginning. Matthew writes of Simeon's words of thanks to God for the experience of seeing and holding the promised Savior. And he offers a blessing to the parents, coupled with a warning. This child will be a catalyst for change and will be confronted and opposed by many. Foreshadowing is such a powerful tool in writing. What might your response be to hearing these words for the first time? Eh, well, that's just a nice story. Or wow, something big will happen in the life of this baby. Or ho-hum, angels and messages all over again. <clears throat> well, most of us here this morning and most Christians know the story and possibly gloss right over the foreshadowing because we know how the scripture story ends. It is not a new story, but an old one. And yet in the birth of Jesus, there is a special beginning. His death at Calvary offers an ending of his earthly life, but also the beginning of another story arc, salvation one that continues to this day and beyond. And each year in churches around the world, the stories about Jesus are told. These stories are shared and celebrated. And each gospel writer offers a different view on the story of Jesus. Matthew and Luke offer the broadest stories, offering the longest beginnings for the baby Jesus. And there is John who offers no birth narrative, but has the word beginning used twice in the first two verses. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Mark has no birth narrative, but starts his story of Jesus with John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness. In his book, the verse one is very important. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now I read the scripture from, from Revelation, which is one of the hardest scripture books to get our heads around. The text is attributed to a John, and for some this man is the same as the gospel writer, but I'll leave that for others to work out. Whomever the writer was, he was an ascetic, possibly a hermit, who spent years meditating away from society, seeking messages from God. The text is full of unfamiliar and fanciful symbolism and strange description. These texts in Revelation, often symbolic rather than exact, are considered apocalyptic writings about the end times. Today's chapter is the second to last, and the verses I read conclude with those well-known words spoken from the throne of God. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. These aren't the final words in Revelation, but they denote the spirit of the book. For in Jesus himself, whose birth we just celebrated again, whose dedication we just read about, and whose earthly life ends on a cross, we are confronted with more symbolism. Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph, and cousin to John the Baptist, is also the son of God and the Messiah. And Jesus, while physically dying on the cross, is still alive. He is both ended and never ended. He is both beginning and ever beginning. Nice sounding words, but what do we, what can we make of them? 
Well, many people are able to carry a sense of Jesus as one being alive in their lives, not just a heavenly being who was on earth and is not now. I have that sense in my basket of faith. Jesus was born, lived, and died, and lives forever again. We celebrate the first, his birth, at this time of the year. We revere Jesus' death at the end of Lent, at Easter time. We review and examine his life over the rest of the calendar year. And in these three parts, this trinity, trinity of life segments, we have an eternal truth. Jesus is, he was, and is again. Jesus is a beginning for John, for the person Jesus was with God in the beginning of time. Jesus is beginning, for his birth is the fulcrum and the foundation that the books of the Christian scriptures are based on. Jesus is the beginning that catalyzes his followers, Jewish and otherwise, to believe, to share, and to die for something larger than life itself. And Jesus is the end that marks a time of transition from monotheistic belief in God, Yahweh, to a belief in a trinity. Jesus is the end as one who dies, yet he lives again. So again, what do we do with this person, this Savior who is, was, and is still? How does his life affect you? And what might we do about angels coming into lives with messages? Recently in the Boston Globe, a writer, Celine Boyle, reflected on the times we live on as she wrote about angels and messages in our words and actions in response to the challenging life we face today in this world. Because I found that her words so moving and important, I quote at length from her reflection where she writes, it's been hard communicating in our country lately. We speak past each other muttering to ourselves or shouting in crowds. We send signals coded in acronyms on ball caps. Instead of engaging, we dismiss, mentally assigning the speaker to a certain category. Oh, they are one of them. It's exhausting and isolating and doesn't lead to compassion or civility. We deserve to do better as we relate with each other. On a fundamental level, our human interactions fail because we are humans interacting with each other. We need to elevate ourselves. This holiday season, let us take a cue from the celebratory environment and give one another the gift of a shifted perspective. Maybe we could talk with one another as if we were angels. Why angels, you might ask? Well, it's their time of year. They show up on trees, on cards. They hover near creches. They beam in spinning light displays across people's houses. They star in Christmas movies. Then they appear in the best carols and hymns of the season. Also, they have the best words. Hark! Behold, woe. When's the last time you tried out any of these words in your discussions or conversations or comments? Talking with one another as if we were celestially cherished beings could really change our conversations. Now, the next time someone says something that is disrespectful, hurtful, or outrageous, before you respond, Count to 10 and consider this phrase. And the angel said, if you say it in your head, you have given yourself the gift of potential to see the speaker differently. This could lead you to a just yet compassionate response. 
if you say aloud, and the angel said, there will likely be a pause in the conversation while the speaker wonders if they are engaging, engaging with an otherworldly presence or just someone a bit wacky. Either way, the phrase isolates a moment for contemplation about the purpose of the conversation. As they regard you with confusion, you can choose to continue talking or you can smile, gesture grandly and say, behold, as you walk away. Now, the best part of this approach is that you can decide to use the phrase preemptively or in response. When someone cuts in front of you while you're waiting to order coffee, think to yourself, and the angel said, and maybe suddenly you're offering guidance, behold the line. This works best with a sweep of your arm gesturing in the appropriate direction. Or a distracted person bumps into you on the sidewalk and you channel your inner angel and respond, lift thine eyes from thy phone. Or in a theater boom, woe unto them who talk aloud during the movie. That's definitely going to alter the moment once you embrace, <coughs> excuse me, our unique human ability to sense or access the divine from the ordinary, you will find that you can shift your experience of almost every situation. So envision yourself as incandescent, winged, soaring aloft. When someone blares their horn and cuts you off in traffic, you might interpret it as trumpets heralding your presence. You will surprise yourself when you call your classroom or next meeting to order with a command of hark. Your perceptions of nuance will expand. You may hear fear instead of belligerence. You may hear uncertainty as opposed to defiance. You may hear exhaustion instead of rudeness. As the carol says, you may hear the angel voices. You decide if it is worth engaging, talking with and listening deeply to one another. And the angel said, be not afraid. Now in Matthew, we hear a message from Simeon about Jesus's life, this newborn, this life just beginning will change all lives. In Revelation, John offers a message to frame God's plan in presence with humanity. Is this voice an angel or Jesus? You must decide. And the message given is vitally important. God will live among mortals. Death will end, and another way to say that is that ending will end, and a new beginning will continue eternally as we live with God. Then another voice declares, I am the beginning and the end. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Can you feel the presence of Jesus in your life? Do you see or hear angels? Are you willing to wrap your life in the gift of the Savior? Finally, can you see Jesus as both and, a beginning and an end, or maybe a beginning without end? Amen. Okay. Will you join me in a spirit of prayer? We give you thanks and praise, O oh God, for you have fulfilled your promises and Jesus has come among us. At this cup, cusp of the calendar and time of transition, <coughs> excuse me, the ending of one and the beginning of a new year, we implore 
implore God's blessings upon our lives and pray for a new year of grace and peace and hope. Your word, O God, called forth the earth, sky, and glittering stars, and your splendor is expressed in all creation. By your angels, you brought words of warning and challenge to a people waiting in darkness. Do not fear. Through your prophets, you called people to be a fertile garden, bringing forth a harvest of righteousness and praise. And now in the fullness of time, our eyes have seen our salvation come. Born of a woman and growing in strength and wisdom, suffering himself while watching the suffering of many, Jesus will fulfill the lifelong yearnings of those who await redemption. And as a beginning, Jesus rose up as a sign of your grace, Lord, Though he was opposed by many and crucified, suffering and end, you, God, raised him to a new life, a new beginning without end. Thus, God, in and through Jesus, you open the way of salvation that we might be adopted as your children and heirs. And Lord, we offer prayers for those mentioned today. We offer prayers for healing and strength for those suffering from COVID, as Rita noted, at Bickford House. And Ann and I offer the same for the community where we live. We've had over 40 cases, uh, mostly in the health center, between staff and residents. And we pray, God, for your peace, for your blessed peace, to come upon lives that are torn asunder by war, by hatred, by indifference. And now throughout all time, you have blessed your people, O God, and dwelt among them. On the eve of this new year, inspire and guide us that all we do may find in you its beginning and fulfillment. Amen. Our closing hymn, our closing hymn for the whole year will be Another Year is Dawning. You will find it on page 567 in the blue hymnal. I invite you to rise as you are able and help us close out the year by declaring another year is dawning.
Depart now in peace, for your eyes have seen the salvation which God has prepared for all people. Go and embrace the new time which God has given us, recognizing Christ in friend and stranger. And as Jesus has been gracious to you, so be gracious to those in need. Now may God shine upon you and make you strong and wise. May Christ Jesus share his inheritance and love with you freely. And may the Holy Spirit open your eyes to the presence of God's wonderful and eternal Messiah. Amen. And may you all have a blessed new year. See you in the new year.